This is Epicenter, episode 335 with guests Tom Pocock and Zach Williamson. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Cuccio. Today, our guests are Tom Pocock and Zach Williamson. So respectively, they are CEO and CTO of Aztec Protocol. Aztec is a platform that enables private token transactions on Ethereum. So at its core, it's a smart contract. It's also known as the Aztec cryptography engine. And here's roughly how it works. So when a user wants to make a private transaction, they deposit funds into the contract, let's say 100 DAI. And then the system issues a zero knowledge note, which corresponds to this die. So as a holder of this note, you can split it up into smaller amounts. You can send it to whomever you like, and then they would redeem that note for the corresponding amount in die. So this is one basic example. And Aztec enables a number of use cases. And we go into that during the interview. The way Aztec is built, it requires that every participant in a transaction is using a wallet that has integrated the protocol. So they built an SDK that allowed developers to do just that and build Aztec into their own wallets. Fadeika actually participated in the trusted setup ignition process, which took place last year. And so she and I did this interview together. So here's what you'll learn in this conversation. How Tom and Zach met and founded Aztec Protocol, what it is and what problems it solves, how Aztec works in practice and under the hood, the challenges of making DeFi systems like MakerDAO fully private, how ERC-20 tokens could be issued as private tokens on-chain, the Aztec Trusted Setup Ignition Ceremony, the types of transactions and business logic made possible by the Aztec Cryptography Engine, the prospect of dark contracts with privacy built in, the security guarantees of using Aztec and other ZKP systems, the use cases for ZKPs for things like privacy and scaling solutions, and the growing privacy ecosystem. These are some very unique times. So it's time for us to think about resetting healthcare, education, money, privacy, environmental policy, work, and collaboration. It's time to reset everything. So on April 29th, I'm organizing a conference where academics, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders will come together to discuss the lasting effects of the COVID-19 crisis. So let me tell you about some of the great speakers that we already confirmed. I'm really excited about these. So Mark Miller, who's been on the podcast, Agoric Chief Scientist and Foresight Senior Fellow. Science fiction author Cory Doctorow will give a talk about how we need to either decentralize or die. Another former guest, Robin Hansen, Associate Professor of Economics at George Mason University, will give a really interesting talk about flattening the curve with deliberate infection. One of my podcast idols, Jeff Jarvis, author of the great book, What Would Google Do? and Professor of Journalism at CUNY will also be speaking about the impacts of COVID on journalism. We have former NASA scientist Creon Levitt giving a talk about the potential upsides of COVID-19. Brian Bellendorf of the Hyperledger Project will speak about the blockchain's role in mitigating the impacts of pandemics. We couldn't talk about COVID-19 without, of course, having Ryan Selkis and also Riva Tez, Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives at Intel, will be speaking. So these are just some of the speakers that have already confirmed, and we're adding new speakers every day. So please register. Registration is free, and you can sign up at ResetEverything.events. About 300 people have already registered, and we hope to have enough speakers to make this run for 24 hours. So once again, it's ResetEverything.events, and it's happening on April 29th. I want to talk to all your founders out there. You're building something that you're super passionate about, and as a founder, you need to think about a lot of stuff, like which platform you're building on, token economics, building a team and raising money. And you're also thinking about security because keeping your users' funds and data safe is a top priority for your business and its reputation. So the crypto space is like a big experimentation lab and lots of these experiments involve people's money. I mean, just think about the very project we're interviewing today in this episode, Aztec. We're talking about very, very cutting edge crypto here, like as cutting edge as it gets. And for these guys, Security should be, and I'm sure it is, it should be woven into every aspect of their organization. And we're not just talking about smart contract audits here, but everything from the company's security policies to front-end user applications. So to help you get into this security mindset, 
the privacy-focused security consulting company, Least Authority, is hosting their first security sessions on April 30th. It's a free online meetup where you will learn about the low-hanging fruit common vulnerabilities that you can fix today, what a security audit actually looks like from start to finish, and exciting developments in blockchain security research. You can ask questions to the team of expert security researchers and get advice about the things that you're most concerned about, and it's free. So to sign up, go to leastauthority.com. Once again, it's happening on April 30th, and there will be several sessions to accommodate all time zones. Do yourself a favor and get your organization into the security mindset. Sign up for security sessions at leastauthority.com slash meetup. The Status Mobile app is now out and it is available in the Apple App Store and Google Play Store. Once you've installed it, join the public channel, Epicenter, come and say hi. And if you ask us, we'll give you some SNT tokens to help you get started and register your Status ENS name. So the speed at which Status is changing is really mind-boggling. So they just released version 1.0. Version 1.2 came out last week. And with 1.2, they've upgraded it from the Whisper protocol to this new peer-to-peer messaging protocol called Waku, which can handle 10 times as many daily active users as Whisper and has a lot of bandwidth consumption optimizations and things like that. So they're constantly upgrading this thing and making it even better. I was just talking with someone from the status team a couple of days ago, and they're telling me about all the things they want to build into it. Like, for example, push notifications. There are no push notifications right now in status because, of course, if you have push notifications with like iOS, all that data is made visible to Apple. So they're thinking of really creative ways to get around those constraints and making sure that the messages that you receive are truly private. And privacy is of the utmost importance. Now, let me tell you something. When you sign up for status, there's no phone number. There's no email address. There's no identifying information. You register with a seed. You create a private key the way it should be. And this is what secures your messages and makes sure that only you can read them. It has a decentralized messenger, a crypto wallet, and a mobile dApp store so you can explore the ecosystem of dApps and safely send, store, and receive crypto, including ERC-20s and some ERC-721s. Download the Status app at status.im or go directly to the Apple App Store and Google Play Store. And with that, here's our interview with Tom Pocock and Zach Williamson. So we're here today with uh, Tom and Zach, the co-founders of Aztec Protocol. Tom and Zach. Would you be able to tell us what you did before you co-founded? Thanks for having us. Originally, I trained a long time ago uh, in maths at undergrad and then had a glancing blow trying to sing for a bit. That didn't go very well. And then I was in banking for a few years, financial services more generally. And it was in about 2016 that I started to hear about Ethereum. I was quite excited actually for its uh, prospects to provide uh, clearinghouse technology to private capital markets. So that was really why the business got going in the first place. I met Zach around that time, and uh, we started to work together on building a platform to enable the capital markets to issue and then trade private debt, principally. And then it wasn't until later on uh, that we uh, switched to Aztec Protocol, which was at the beginning of 2018. What about you, Zach? What did you do before Aztec? So before Aztec, I started out as a particle physicist, physicist doing experimental neutrino physics then decided that really academia wasn't the life for me and transitioned into software engineering and programming and development. And after about a year of of doing that, I started dabbling with blockchain. I met Tom. We started working together on this Tom Susan credit. And then from there, I kind of fell into zero knowledge cryptography and um, fell down that rabbit hole. And that ended up being becoming Aztec. So what was it about uh, zero knowledge technologies that you guys found particularly interesting and that made you want to really dive in headfirst in these protocols? In the first instance, it was just we couldn't really progress the platform we were building on. We wanted the clearing benefits, the trustless trading benefits uh, of Ethereum for these private loans. Uh, We knew that it was going to be a non-starter to do any kind of business on public blockchains uh, without privacy. So really, that's why uh, Zach started to look into uh, zero-knowledge techniques when we were on the Entrepreneur First program, because there seemed to be no other solution for efficient privacy. So that's really what got us 
got us going on this. It was a, it was a need rather than a kind of being aesthetically pulled towards this technology. I had entrepreneur first. So you told us before the show that you actually met in a private setting beforehand and then went on together to entrepreneur first. Tell us about what this program does. And you also met a lot of the people who now work at Adstack there, right? That's right. Yes. So the idea of the Entrepreneur First program, which started in London, uh, is now gone, I think, to six cities uh, globally. And the idea is that they have both capital and then a, a location for putting uh, founders in touch with one another and giving them some seed capital. And the idea, certainly when we joined, was you'd have someone with a kind of with a domain background. So in that case, this was me, I had background in banking, and then someone with a, ideally a deep technology background. So in that case, uh, it was Zach. And they try to pair these people up and put them into a team. They put them through a six-month program. And at the end, you then get to uh, present to a lot of the leading, uh, both European and US investors. Zach and I were a little unusual in that we had been working certainly weekends together for about eight or nine months, uh, building this thing before we joined. So we really joined because we thought uh, it would put us in front of the top VCs in a relatively efficient way rather than looking for a co-founder. But as it turned out, we found two very talented other people, uh, one Arno Schenk, who's now our COO, and one Joe Andrews, who's now our CPO. And uh, we asked them to join uh, whilst we were on, on the Entrepreneur First program. Let's move on to EdTech Protocol itself. So in a nutshell, what does it do? So in a nutshell, it enables private tokens on Ethereum. It's a kind of a privacy layer that you can use to either create a private token that acts a little bit like somewhat like an ELC20 token, or you can wrap an existing ELC20 token and uh, make transfers of it private. Although I should qualify that by saying what will be obscure are the values being sent around so that um, you can send me like private wrapped Ethereum or uh, private DAI and nobody can see how much you transferred. But at the moment, we do expose identities. This is a very deliberate decision to keep the gas costs of the protocol to a minimum. That's currently what the asset protocol does at the moment. We have plans to significantly enhance its functionality over the coming year based on some research and develop some research that we've um, incubated uh, that dramatically increases the scope of what we can do because we now have a kind of a system of general purpose private computation that we can use to create not just private tokens, but complex um, business logic, complex transaction flows uh, that has applications that go beyond like, simple value transfers. Cool. So that's Plunk, and we'll get to that in a bit. Just from a super practical perspective, say I have a hundred zero knowledge die, and I want to send them to Sebastian. What do I do? You would use some a private wallet interface or some software that uses the Aztec developer toolkit. From your perspective, it would look exactly like a regular transfer. You would say, "I want to, you know, to Sebastian's address. I want to send him ten die." The uh, only real difference that um, from the user's perspective will be a couple of extra digital signatures that need to be signed over a traditional ERC-20 token transfer. But our focus on when it comes to our tooling and resources has been to make this a, from the user's perspective, completely indistinguishable from a regular token transfer. And would Sebastian then also need a wallet that kind of supports zero-knowledge die, or would that just be on my end? And what kind of wallets are out there that currently support this? So Sebastian would need a private wallet to redeem the DAI and convert it, either send it to somebody else or convert it back into public tokens. Our protocol, we released it, at, um, I think it's been just about over a month now. There are a few teams currently building integrations and we're building something we're calling the kiosk, which is kind of a demonstration dApp that uses private transfers as a model to build off of. We're hoping for some wallets to come on stream in the, in the relatively near future. You can actually go and uh, have a play around with this kiosk. Uh, it's ZK Money is the address. It's very quick. You don't. There's not a complicated sign-up process. We decided to build it really because even though our our principal business is providing uh, private technologies to developers, we're getting a lot of demand from uh, people in the crypto community wanting to play around with ZK Dai and obviously not wanting to wait the lead time to wait for DApps to come out. So we built this uh, ZK dot Money so people can play around with ZK Dai and ZK Wrapped ETH uh, straight away. So I want to come back to this practical aspect uh, for a moment. Frederica would like to send me a hundred die, but you know, so Frederica is very privacy mindful, and maybe I'm not so privacy mindful, right? And like I'm just using an Argent wallet, like everybody else. And she's like, "Hey, I'm going to send Seb some some die over this confidential transaction. I have his Argent uh, ENS name. 
and I'm just going to send that transaction to that address. Is this possible? And like with the DAI, like what would happen to that DAI if I don't have an Aztec enabled wallet? Uh, can you talk about some of the sort of practical aspects of uh, how this actually works? So practically, it does require both the sender and the recipient to have some kind of wallet uh, that can talk to the ASIC protocol and like send the requ- uh, Ethereum transactions required to convert into and out of the private sphere. But from other than that, it should be relatively, um, like the flow is, is the same. You can extract all the information you need to send a private transaction through an ENS domain name. So that, that is all that Frederica would need. And then once she sent that private die to you, it would be like uh, the equivalent of receiving an ERC20 token and you would need um, some wallet support to actually access those funds. But yeah, those funds will be waiting for you until, until you could. In order to go from having just regular die to this private die, what are the steps necessary? So would this just be built into the wallet where you send that die to like a smart contract? Or can you talk a little bit about sort of the specifics of like how this works under the hood without getting into the ZK part of it, but just sort of the specifics of how that works? Happy to do so. So under the hood, you do need to make a deposit transaction. So in zk.money, we have an explicit flow for like funding a wallet where you would uh, effectively send us a single Ethereum transaction that will convert some DAI that you own into private DAI. The way that works under the hood is we have a smart contract uh, called uh, ACE, the Aztec Cryptography Engine. It's a custodian of your public tokens whilst they're in a kind of a private form. So what will happen is you will send ACE some DAI tokens. ACE will then give you, in return, a, a zero-knowledge credit a claim on the, that DAI that you can then trade around, you can split it up, you can send it to whoever you want, and then they can, and anybody who has one of these notes can then redeem DAI from a ACE back in exchange for tokens. Okay, so just to sum up, I as a user, I'm using an Aztec enabled wallet. I send funds to a smart contract. That smart contract then holds these funds and issues a note, which is essentially represents these funds. This note represents the private DAI. So let's say I send 100 DAI to this smart contract. I then get a note representing 100 DAI. I can break that up in how many parts I want and send it over to someone. When that person receives the note, then I suppose they can just extract the DAI back into sort of their public wallet and then send that to uh, any Ethereum address. Yes, precisely. I was thinking about this, you know, while reading your blog post and is it the case that if very few people, because you mentioned earlier that identities are not obfuscated or, or not private, but if, if very few people are using this smart contract, maybe not for DAI, but let's say it gets implemented for another ERC-20 token that has little usage or a lot less volume, would someone analyzing this contract and sort of like flows of, of tokens coming in and out be able to perhaps extract who's sending money to whom? I mean, maybe not in the amounts themselves, but make some assumptions about who's transacting with who. Is, was that, is that like a, a, an attack vector that you guys have thought of? They certainly would. Uh, as we're kind of confidential and, uh, only at this point, you're right. I mean, the, the, less, uh, the fewer transactions you have going through the system, pseudo-anonymity only gets you so far unless you have a lot of volume going through the network. There are a couple of things I would say here, which is, first of all, Aztec was originally built uh, for assets that were zero knowledge from day one. In other words, what we've applied it to is where the crypto capital is at the moment, which is visible DAI. And so we've created these contracts to enable people to kind of convert in and out of that visible DAI through this deposit scheme that Zach was talking about. But our kind of our long term vision for how people will use privacy is that these uh, assets will be created in zero knowledge from their very creation. In other words, something like DAI at some point in the future, it's the process of uh, opening a CDP, getting your DAI, sending it, the whole process start to finish would be private. And that would then remove the ability uh, or vastly reduce the ability for people to mine the network uh, for data. The second point is also we don't hide the transaction graph at this point, but we will do when we make our, our upgrade, upgrade to the long system. That obviously also introduces uh, a great opportunity for people to data mine and see who's transacting with who. That is something that we will be eliminating in our future uh, network upgrade. I mean, these data mining attacks, they are pretty common in the zero knowledge space. So basically, you see them on Tornado and then Green and so on. But let's say I now have a ZK die. Is there any chance I can actually use them in a confidential way, say on Uniswap or so? 
At the moment, because the, the protocol is brand new, uh, all of the ex- kind of existing DeFi infrastructure, you can get it to work in a zero-knowledge world, but, the, but it requires a little bit of work to do so. So what we have at the moment is we don't just have the ability to do basic transfers. We launched the protocol with seven distinct types of transaction flow that you can, uh, well, seven distinct zero-knowledge proofs that you can assemble to create more complex business logic. So you can do things like bilateral swaps if you want to create a decentralized private exchange. And we have thing we have ways of like performing dividend payments um, so that you can have interest bearing or dividend bearing private financial instruments. The long term aspirations is to make it so that you never need to leave the private sphere. So that once you have private funds, uh, like either from a public asset or from a fully private asset, any kind of economic activity that you want to do with that asset, you can do through zero knowledge proof, zero knowledge protocols, so that you never need to um, convert your assets into public tokens and then obviously reveal information. The bet we're making as a company is that whilst we're not necessarily using these uh, blockchain systems for day-to-day transactions, the amount that we care about privacy is potentially pretty low. As we start to shift more and more of our day-to-day identifying transactions onto these networks, that's the point at which we expect privacy to have to percolate throughout these systems because otherwise we'll be leaving extremely valuable pools, reservoirs of data available for the whole world to see and to analyze. And therefore, we would expect privacy to be a kind of prerequisite for dealing with DeFi systems in the medium term. There are some very interesting problems that I'd say are probably as yet unsolved about enshrouding uh, DeFi with privacy. Uh, Just some really interesting practical problems. So if you just think about something like MakerDAO, and obviously we we all know it's um, Super exciting project, but of course, uh, comes with enough problems even in the visible setting. Now imagine putting all of its collateral base into a private wrapper. So how now does, uh, does the MakerDAO system uh, make sure that its CDPs are not underwater? I say it's hard enough even when you know the price of which ETH is trading and what, and what all the collateralization ratios on these CDPs are. Now make all of that collateral private, make the DAI balances private, make the CDPs private. And what you now have is a massively paranoid DeFi system, because the DeFi system has to keep on tapping every CDP uh, holder on the shoulder and saying, I don't believe you're not underwater now. I know you you weren't underwater 10 seconds ago because you sent me a proof, but please send me another proof. And please send me another proof. And it'll have to keep on asking all of those uh, borrowers from the system to prove that they're still in a position of excess collateral, that they're not underwater, in other words, that the die is fully supported. There are interesting ways that you could solve for that. For example, if you knew what the asset type was that was backing the system or the particular CDP, if the system was allowed to know, well, okay, I don't know how much collateral's in here, I don't know how much die has been issued off the back of that collateral, but I know what the collateral type is, I know the price it's trading at, you can then start to reduce some of these problems of the system having to keep on in this paranoid fashion, asking for more and more proofs that you're in in a position of excess collateral. There are ways that if you, as a borrower from the system, were prepared to give up just a little bit of information, you could stop the system from pestering you too often. So there are probably ways to solve that, but it's uh, putting DeFi in a totally private setting is going to be quite a complex uh, enterprise. What parts of the DeFi ecosystem can we make private without too much complexity and overhead? I mean, could we conceivably make all ERC-20 token transfers private without provoking like this computational or sort of this overhead? Are there parts of DeFi that you think we could make private like DEXs, for example, or like token transfers in Uniswap or something like that? I'm asking this from, from a very sort of like novice perspective because I'm like, I'm super, super familiar about zero knowledge technologies. The really low hanging fruit here is uh, ERC-20 tokens that are not backed by another form of collateral. So for example, if you have, I don't know, make a coin or th- there's a load of assets out there. I mean, I suppose that's backed by the collateral, it's cash flow, so it may not be, be a great example. But uh, if you have uh, an asset whose uh, value is inherent to the asset and there's, there's no further collateral to look behind, it's very easy to issue that asset afresh in a zero knowledge context. But you, in order that you don't have this issue where 
you know, in the case of ZK die, currently you put the die into the contract and you get back a kind of a sleeve, a zero knowledge wrapper, a zero knowledge equivalent, you have less of a visible trace because everyone sees that you've put in 20 or 30 die. So for anyone uh, issuing new ERC, ERC20 tokens or wanting to fully migrate to a private setting, they can do that. And thereafter, every single transaction that's done in that ERC20 asset will then be uh, completely confidential. So that's the kind of the easy answer to that question. The other thing I think uh, which could be done basically instantly is something like USDC. So that does have, obviously, it's collateralized, but it's collateralized in an off-chain asset, which is not visible to the world. So there's another example of where you could have a stable coin. Now, whether you call that DeFi or not, I mean, some people wouldn't qualify that as DeFi, uh, but that's another type of asset you could put on mainnet without ever leaving a visible trace of the amounts involved. Right, perhaps even security tokens or you know, um, real estate backed tokens or this sort of thing. Exactly. In fact, it was security tokens that Aztec was originally designed for in the very first place. When it comes to zero knowledge at DeFi, there's kind of there's a hierarchy of complexity that Tom was des- describing. You have uh, the, the most basic thing is kind of unilateral transactions. So if I'm sending somebody or you're sending somebody some tokens or some asset or something like that, where it's completely non-interactive. It's very easy to translate to a private setting. The next level up are bilateral interactions, so trades uh, between two people. Like I'm trading something so like a digital asset with you, or I'm engaging in some kind of uh, like futures trading or betting system. And that is also quite practical to achieve in a zero knowledge world. It takes a bit more work, but you can do it. You then get to kind of multilateral computations which become a lot harder. So things, as Tom said, things like DAI, things where you have some kind of um, collateral base uh, where you need to perform quite complex computations uh, involving uh, like inputs from lots of different people, like, for example, managing a CDP. That's significantly harder to do. And we see our kind of efforts focusing mostly on the first two use cases um, in the short term. And then once we've summited those peaks, then we'll, we'll focus on the, on the more complex systems. We kind of understand what uh, AdSec can currently do and what uh, you're looking to be able to do in the future. So let's look at how this works under the hood. So basically, this is all powered by zero knowledge proofs. And for that, you actually did a trusted setup that you call the ignition ceremony. So tell us about this and uh, then let's kind of unpack the steps of creating a zero knowledge proof from there. So as far as the ignition ceremony is concerned, uh, as you may be aware, for zero knowledge snark systems, they depend on this kind of piece of mathematical scaffolding known as a reference string. And it's a way of really making the computations that you need to do for a zero knowledge proof sufficiently speedy that you can get this stuff to public networks straight away. So it allows the kind of the proof size to be quite small and the amount of work that needs to be done for you to send a transaction to be kept relatively low. What it does mean, though, is it's, it's predicated on computing a kind of encrypted number, but no one must know what that encrypted number is. And so the way we did this was through a sort of form of multi-party computation where we went to our community of people who were interested in the Aztec protocol and said, will you take part in this ceremony? And this ceremony is such that it would require every single one of these participants to collude with everyone else in order to be able to reconstruct this number that actually needs to be destroyed and never known. So if just one person behaves honestly and they destroy their their toxic information, the system's secure. So we thought we can design this ceremony so that it's not just good for the current Aztec system, but also for future SNARP systems as well. And so we can go big on this. We can go out to the world and say institutions, uh, individuals who are interested in privacy, preferably as maximally geographically distributed as, as possible, please come and take part one after the next, layer in your toxic information, your toxic waste. Please uh, attest to the fact you've destroyed it. And in doing so, we can create this really secure reference string that everyone knows and trusts is not uh, susceptible to corruption. And so, so that's what we did. We ran that ceremony for, in the end, about two months. Originally, it was going to go on for just a month, but we had a, a lot of uh, interest from participants. We had 200 participants in all, uh, of whom just under 180 uh, successfully completed the computation. And those participants came, yes, largely from the Ethereum community, but also from the Tezos community as well. We had uh, major banks and institutions. We can't name any one of those institutions, unfortunately, because we've they're going to, to release that information in their own time. And the point is, if you can look at just one participant, you as a user of the system, and say, well, I trust they didn't collude with anyone else, you then know the setup's secure. 
that's how the ignition ceremony uh, worked. How did you design this ceremony? I mean, like, was there sort of a threshold that you were looking at? Is, is 200 sort of a, a good agreed upon number? Or is it the case that would it be better to have 1,000? Or does the benefits sort of flatten off after you reach a certain threshold? There's only kind of one perfect number, which is 7 billion. Um, but that's kind of somewhat unworkable. So you'd like every participant in the world who's ever going to conceivably use the system to take part. But the truth is, uh, it's obviously it's given the amount of time that it takes to do this computation. I mean, we really actually shrank down the the length of this reference string to make sure the computation could be done on a home computer. And even including 200 people, that took 30 days plus the, the time that we added on at the end. So 200 people, our sense was they were sufficiently well distributed geographically. You can see them on a map. If you go to our Ignition website, which is on the Aztec Protocol website, you can actually see where all of these people, where most of these people came from. There were a few you know, people who decided not to declare who they were or where they were from, and that's fine, but, but most people have attested. All you need to know is that if some handful of people that I look at, you know, be that Vitalik, be that uh, Tesla's Foundation, be that some institutions... If you feel it's inconceivable that these people knew one another, interacted with one another, shared their data, that's sufficient for you to know that this reference string is, is secure. So 200 people, there's no perfect number, but it feels that the probability is wound essentially down to zero by having 200 people who provably mostly don't all know one another and have an interest in making the system secure. So how similar is this ceremony to, let's say, the, the, the ceremony that goes into uh, creating a, a root certificate? And in that case, I mean, for the little I know about the ceremonies is that they're fairly robust and, and you know, people are locked away in bunkers, etc. Like, what is the level of security that these ceremonies provide? What's the benefit of having like this level of security as opposed to just doing like a multi-party computation with 200 people like randomly picked on the Internet? The ASIC MPC was structured in a way that we didn't need to take as many kind of extreme precautions as the ceremonies that you were describing. Our ceremonies also, the construction of it, it's, it's based off of the um, Zcash sampling multi-party computation. And so like the, the, it's, the security proofs behind it are relatively conventional. The reason why y- you would want to do things like lock yourself away in a bunker or drive out into the middle of the Gobi Desert um, with a laptop that you assembled from like secondhand parts uh, that you've uh, sourced from all over the world a lot of that is because a lot of these multi-party computations, they exist in two phases where imagine you have a set of participants. A lot of these comput- NPCs require the participants to generate some toxic waste, but then keep hold of that toxic waste and kind of preserve it whilst everybody else participates in like the first half of the computation. And then the NPC will proceed into a second phase where everybody then needs to use that, the toxic waste that they previously generated to perform some extra computations. And that's extremely dangerous because that means that you need to keep hold of this toxic waste. You need to know what it is. It needs to be lying around your computer on memory, in memory, on a hard disk, perhaps. And you need to be extremely careful about exposing that toxic waste. For the Aztec NPC, it's a much simpler affair where there is only a single like, round. When you participate in the, in the ceremony, you generate some toxic waste, you force the computations, and then that's it. Once you've taken part in that single atomic process, you can destroy your toxic waste and forget about it. You don't need to hold on to it. And so that makes the ceremony a lot more secure and means that we don't need to take as many extreme precautions. I'm reasonably certain that this setup works because I also participated in it and I destroyed my toxic waste. Um, so now we have this trusted setup with uh, this very long number that is secret to every single person. So now what you guys have done is you have created seven different kinds of proofs based on this. Um, So from my understanding, that send, swap, dividend, mint, burn, and public and private range. So what kind of business logics do these building blocks actually allow you to build in a privacy-preserving fashion? So the business logic that it enables is we have uh, three main types of transaction that you can do with these. You'll, you have your basic unilateral, unilateral transaction, like I'm sending you private DAI, you're sending me private DAI or private tokens. You then have a bash or swap proof, so you can take two different private assets, trade them amongst two people. Like if you and I wanted to say swap private DAI for private ETH, then you would use this bash or swap proof to do so um, without revealing information. We also have something called a dividend proof, which is a way of proving that like, some encrypted sum of tokens is equal to a percentage of another encrypted set of tokens. 
So you can do, use that to create um, interest-bearing, dividend-bearing financial, uh, private financial tokens. On top of that, we also have uh, what we call mint and burn proofs, which is a way, ways of uh, just directly printing or destroying private tokens without having to uh, convert public tokens. And so you would, you would use these for a fully private financial instrument. So if you wanted to create, for example, a, a private loan like at syndication, at issuance, you would then um, use the mint proof to print like these, these loan tokens. And similarly, we have a burn proof where you can, which can be used to destroy uh, tokens. So Sebastian alluded to this earlier, but basically the moment that actually something is within the AdSec ecosystem, I'm actually giving a node which is a claim on an asset. Um, so this uh, node model is, you know, the UTXO model that we know from Bitcoin and Zcash and so on. Why did you choose this UTXO architecture? Because basically working with complex smart contracts is more difficult in this setting, no? It does add, add complications. The reason why we went with the UTXO model is because it's significantly easier to give strong privacy guarantees um, in a UTXO model than it is in an account-based model. Because in an account-based model, imagine you and I have encrypted balances of some token. If I want to send you some an encrypted token, I need to somehow add to your encrypted balance. And I, myself, I don't know what your balance is. Now that it can be done, we chose deliberately to not to, to go down that route because it would make made our zero knowledge proofs significantly more expensive to, like in terms of gas costs on Ethereum to, to verify, um, which would have made the, tra the, the transfer costs much higher. Um, and the kind of the overheads of UTX terminal, um, we can abstract away with our own like developer kit so that if you're a developer integrating Aztec, you don't need to worry about the UTX model. Our SDK exposes like a straightforward interfaces that you would expect from a traditional account-based model, like, you know, get somebody's balance, send, send somebody tokens. Longer term, if you want to break the transaction graph entirely, so you want to hide not just the values being sent, but the identities, then that makes an account-based model extremely difficult to do because if you're hiding people's identities, then you don't really want there to be a kind of a, like one encrypted number which represents somebody's balance because making repeated modifications to this balance, it's, it's very difficult to do that without leaking the fact that those transactions are connected. There are ways of doing it, but uh, they, they come with some significant drawbacks. It's much easier to use statistical analysis to kind of um, find out what's going on uh, in these systems. So you spoke earlier about the fact that you're moving to a new system called Plonk. So basically, so far, you've had these seven different kind of proofs that one could kind of uh, assemble to different business logics. But I, my understanding is that this Plonk architecture allows you to do general computation in a much more general way. So um, how does that work and uh, what does that allow you to do? So the way it works is you can create arbitrary so in, in the, the th technically called, they're called arithmetic circuits, but effectively they're programs. You can, you can write traditional computer programs and convert them into zero knowledge proofs. So you can then, you can then effectively prove to somebody, serve a mathematical proof that you have executed a certain computation and you can choose to keep the inputs and outputs of that, of that um, computation private and encrypted. And you can use that to create things like um, private tokens and private transfers, but obviously it's much more expressive and more powerful. And so you can, you can evaluate complex business logic. You can do things like evaluate multi-party computations to do not just bilateral trades, but like multilateral interactions, like risk signatures or those, those kinds of more complex, build those more complex systems. And so what we want to do with it is effectively add programmability into the Aztec protocol so that as a developer, build, if you're building a, a private token or private asset or private anything, you get to program yourself what the transaction logic or the business logic is going to be. And obviously this is, this is a lot more uh, exten extensible than uh, having to assemble your logic out of seven specific proofs. Let's move on to the, the ecosystem. And I mean, one of the things that I find particularly challenging with regards to protocols that build on top of Ethereum is that it's required upon apps to to integrate uh, these protocols in, in order for a large number of people to be able to use them. How do you guys uh, sort of look at this problem and how are you 
um, working with wallets, dApps, and uh, other applications within the, the Ethereum ecosystem to, to integrate Aztec widely. And are there, are there ways that we can sort of generalize these things so that anybody using any application would be able to leverage Aztec without the app itself having uh, needing uh, to, to integrate it? So I think the first answer to that is the way we're uh, working with the ecosystem is principally through our SDK. So it's this, it's this uh, thing dealing with these private assets, as um, Zach was alluding to earlier, is, it's, it's pretty complicated. You've got to manage private notes, viewing keys, all kinds of uh, structural complications. So the first thing we can do for the ecosystem is just try to make these complexities go away. And the SDK is the, it's the sort of, I won't say black box, but it's the, it's the management system that makes dealing with private assets as close as possible for the developer to, in, to dealing with a, a, an ERC-20 token. There is some extent to which it is impossible to make privacy some, uh, just a switch you can just turn on and off without any real integration at all, not least because the management of your state, the way you record ownership of assets, is just markedly different by definition to visible assets. And so I think there's never going to be a point at which you can just say, here's your privacy switch, turn it on, turn it off. Again, the, probably the closest we can go to that is by uh, working, and this is a kind of a long-term project, uh, both for us and for, for, for other people uh, in the industry, to uh, develop some uh, language norms uh, around a dark contract system. So in other words, doing as much as we can to go back to the engineer, to the developer, and say that we don't know exactly what you want privacy for. And you might want to you know, tweaks, you might want some additional, some additional logic, you might want to keep, for example, uh, stream income, you may not want to just send income, uh, you might want to uh, have all sorts of conditions around uh, escrow management for payments uh, that we haven't thought of and haven't expressly provided you with a proof to do. And so probably the best way that we can put that into the hands of the developer is by moving to a, a dark contract system in the longer term, where we can uh, enable the developer to send a variable private to say, I don't, want to, I don't want to expose a balance in this asset, or I don't want to expose uh, the conditions or the, um, or the, the inputs around uh, how I apportion a payment uh, between two parties. Whatever it may be, we need to put that power back into the hands of the user. And that's why long term, it's inevitable, I think, that these smart contract languages are going to have to absorb some concept of what it means to turn a, turn a, a variable private. Is there any work being done in, in this to, to sort of move things in this direction? Is this something that we're seeing already or are we just too early for that sort of thing to occur? It is early. I mean, it does. It requires a slightly more sophisticated form of, of developer, by definition, because they've got to understand a little bit more about, about how zero knowledge technology works. Um, but it is also something that it's, it's firmly on the, the mid to longer term agenda. It's just that we can probably deliver uh, privacy using a sort of 80-20 Pareto rule. We can probably deliver uh, packaged privacy rather more directly without the complexities of an entire language to go around it through our SDK at the moment, uh, through using a, a number of kind of out-of-the-box proofs. In the longer term, though, uh, that will certainly, I think, unquestionably be, be a feature of smart contract programming is that you'll, have, you'll actually be in a, in a dark contract uh, setting. So it's not a, an immediate pressing concern for us because the things we really see this being used for are things like, you know, payments and escrow, and uh, that's all the low-hanging fruit that we can get to much, much, much faster. Is there anyone already building on this protocol? There are people. No, no one we can announce at this point. Uh, as much as anything, you know, we're six, six, seven weeks into the life of the protocol, and at the moment, it's proofs of concept. So I'd be kind of hesitant to, uh, to name any names at this point. Obviously, uh, it's a pressing concern for wallets to integrate the stuff, uh, to, to be able to kind of deal with private assets. And there are some, I think anyone doing, doing payments, doing whether it's you know, sending of, of, of salary or, or peer-to-peer payments or, or merchant payments, anyone doing that kind of activity on Web3, clearly privacy will be a pre- prerequisite. And clearly we're trying to uh, encourage adoption uh, using our SDK um, to those kinds of early users, but uh, no one we're prepared to talk about just at this point. Okay, I see. And um, as a company, what's your business model in all of this, actually? So that's a great question. It's not, it's not something that we're publicly uh, nailing our colors to the mast on. That's partly because I think we have to see 
to a great extent, how people use our, our privacy products uh, to be able to work out where best to monetize and where best to make sure that we're not introducing frictions uh, which will deter users. So, I mean, it's certainly possible to say uh, we've spoken a little bit about our uh, these privacy proofs. We've not really talked much about their prospects for, for recursion, because, of course, uh, SNARKs you can use not just to send a transaction private, but also to roll up transactions and to get uh, efficiency. And so it may very well be that uh, someone providing, for example, a, a roll-up service uh, can say, OK, ordinarily it would cost you, let's say, low hundreds of thousands gas to do a private transaction, which you send straight to mainnet. Instead of that, uh, send your transaction to us. We won't, we won't look under the hood. We can't because you're sending us a, a, a private transaction. But we can roll up and aggregate your transactions with 100 or 200 or 300 other transactions and then repatriate them, send them back to mainnet, Uh, And so what that means is we've now been able to amortize, to split the gas cost of that one transaction amongst several hundred transactions rather than you bearing the entire gas cost on your own. Now, that actually, I think, for a a roll-up provider offers uh, in one model of this this world quite an interesting business case because you can say, okay, we've now managed to reduce the cost of doing business on mainnet and we can probably make a sustainable margin by being one of the major roll-up providers. There are also ways by which uh, possibly in the future, our SDK uh, could earn revenue by, you know, developers uh, paying for use of the SDK to make dealing with private assets uh, really, really easy. So those are kind of two potential avenues of monetization. I won't say we're wedded to either one of them yet, just because I think it's going to depend a great deal on on who's integrating uh, privacy into their dApps. As, as interoperability becomes the norm in the future, and I think we can all agree that this is where things are heading, how do you see Aztec play a role in providing private transactions between chains? Is that something that you know would be possible and that uh, you're looking at, that you're sort of thinking about? It is something that we're thinking about, and absolutely something that's possible. It's going to take a little bit of time um, to fully implement trustless private swaps between chains because the most practical way of doing this. Uh, or not, maybe not the most practical, the most secure way of doing this is to embed light clients into these blockchain protocols. So, for example, if if Ethereum had a Bitcoin light client um, as a smart contract, then Ethereum would be able to reason perfectly about, well, relatively perfectly about Bitcoin state as well as any other Bitcoin node. But obviously, you can't right now implement the Bitcoin protocol as a as a smart contract on Ethereum because like the computational overheads are orders, many orders of magnitude too large. But this is something that Snarks can and will help with. Um, so you can have a, for example, a smart contract on Ethereum that verifies snark proofs that where you have a snark circuit, a snark program that effectively acts like the Bitcoin light clients and through recursive snark composition, basically you, you, you have a snark circuit which will validate Bitcoin block headers, uh, um, and, uh, repeatedly. And so you can, you can build up a kind of an understanding of Bitcoin state and to do so where that kind of that computational burden, it's offloaded to a single transaction center instead of the entire Ethereum network. And we see that being extremely practical in the future. Zero knowledge technology does need to improve a little bit before that's become before it's fast enough to do that that evaluate that kind of complex logic. But we think we're at most only a year a year away from doing that. And then then that'll be very exciting because we can just embed like clients uh, into protocols like Ethereum to do private swaps. That would be really cool. I mean so this is also brings to mind the question of you know, use cases for zero knowledge. And, you know, we've seen a lot of use cases around uh, things like scalability sort of come up in the, in the last uh, one, one or two years. In your view, how much of the ZK research is focused on doing things like scalability through rollups and how much of the research, at least in the blockchain space, is more focused on on privacy? And do you think there's a good balance there or should should we see more of research and interest coming into the privacy side? That's a good question. I think the majority of the research is on scaling because that's seen a lot, a lot of people, particularly Ethereum foundations, see that as a kind of the existential problem that they need to solve. There is an extreme amount of overlap between scaling and privacy, or at least privacy, like the solutions for privacy can be applied to scaling. It's not necessarily the other way around. So I do, I do see them converging in the near future. Um, there's a lot of research that we've been doing around for our privacy protocol to improve the efficiency of clock that can be directly translated into um, scaling. So there's some some work that's been that's been um, published recently that we we've, we've done um, 
is to make the um, plant more efficient. But it's also being used to explore scaling, specific, specifically um, representing state trees, um, like Ethereum's state, in a way that's uh, more efficient than the, than the Merkle trees that are currently used. And things like that. There's a lot of cross-pollination. So I do see the, the two kind of research paths converging in, in the near future. With all of the innovations that are coming out of the ZK space, so like to the you know the the user of cryptocurrencies, like people who use Ethereum, etc. That you know there's there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of excitement around privacy preserving systems, and more generally, I just think you know as someone who uses uh, Signal for ninety percent of their messaging and like doesn't have like a Facebook account or this sort of thing, like you know, for specifically for privacy reasons, uh, I feel like generally it's hard to get people excited about privacy. What are some of the best ways you think that we can get people excited about privacy? Uh, is this uh, is this something that's reserved to a, a you know a, a sort of niche of people, or or are there broader other ways that we can make privacy more attractive to like the general public? Yeah, so I mean, I would put it that you can more easily get people exercised rather than excitable about privacy. And what I mean by that is, as I alluded to earlier, you know, whilst we're doing things like putting tiny amounts of our capital into CDPs or into a compound or whatever, if there's nothing really about those transactions that, that tells a story about us, uh, that identifies us, that tells us, you know, where we go and get our coffee in the morning, where we live, what our spending habits are, what our preferences are. So really... There's no question that uh, privacy becomes important as something that the average everyday person becomes extremely exercised about as soon as they feel that they're starting to use Web3 for things that tell the story about them. So take an example, payments of salary, streaming of salary. As soon as someone's starting to pay salary and to receive a salary on mainnet, the recipient of that salary is going to immediately say, well, I'm not happy with this being broadcast uh, on mainnet. And then my onbound transactions people who are receiving money from me out of that salary, uh, being able to tell how much I've been paid. I mean, we had actually one internal example in our company, which was quite funny because we're a privacy company. It was actually uh, Paul Burke, who now runs Sablier, and Tom Waite, one of our engineers. And uh, Paul sent some money to Tom, and Tom was then able to expose Paul's entire crypto trading history uh, just by looking uh, at Paul's, Paul's account. That's one point at which, you know, before that transaction occurred, they might have thought nothing of it. But as soon as they realized all of the, the reservoir of economic history that one of them had already built up on mainnet, thinking actually it wasn't all that significant, uh, that the realization came, wow, this is an absolute prerequisite to doing any meaningful day-to-day -day, uh, activities uh, on these public networks. So I think it's going to be a matter of people getting exercised, not necessarily excited about privacy, because they feel they can't really do anything meaningful on these networks without it. Oh, I'm totally excited about the privacy. So the one, the one last thing that I would really like to talk about is the security standards. Cryptography, when it comes down to it, it's super hard maths and it's easy to get it wrong. Um, so basically to demonstrate that early last year, so early 2019, Zcash fixed a bug that had been known to them for a year. It was a cryptographic flaw in a paper that they used. The if exploited, it would have allowed anyone to create an arbitrary number of Zcash tokens that would have been undetected had they been created in the shielded pool. I mean, obviously, Zcash has been around for, uh, around for a long time and they have fantastic scientists and basically their subject meta expertise is fantastic. So basically, what kind of security assurances can you give the people who use your SDKs and um, actually deposit tokens in, uh, in the pool that you give them then a tokenized claim to? What kind of security guarantees can you give these people? When it comes to the security of a cryptographic protocol, there's really three main categories where um, it can be uh, exposed as being insecure. The first one is just simply implementation, like you've not correctly expressed the mathematics and code and your software is buggy. We want to kind of assure people who use our protocol that the code isn't flawed. Um, we've gone through two full security audits on our smart contract and associated code to validate that, yes, the code is a correct expression of the mathematics and there's no vulnerability on that side of things. The other two ways that a cryptographic protocol can be exposed to insecure is either there is a flaw in the security proof. So every cryptographic protocol has like a, a soundness proof that demonstrates that uh, it tends to mathematically prove 
that the only way an attacker can compromise a system is by performing specific computations that are considered to be basically impossible given today's current technology. And so if that proof has a flaw, then the protocol will be insecure. That's what got Zcash. Um, and ASEC's proofs, um, we, our Sunos proofs, they've been validated by quite a few cryptographers now. I mean, obviously, I, uh, I can't give like, like a perfect claim that it will never be found to be compromised, but you know, it's, it's, I, it's extremely confident. I, I can be extremely confident of that, particularly with regards to Planck, because one of, one of our co-authors was Ariel Gabazon, the same person who actually found the Zcash bug. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm extremely confident that there's no underlying form of soundness proofs that we have. The third way that a protocol can be compromised is if the cryptographic assumptions being used are not strong. And so the idea is, I mentioned before previously that a security proof will show that an attacker has to solve, perform certain computations that we think are impossible. Obviously, if those computations turn out to not be impossible and turn out to be quite easy, that's a problem. All of the technology that Aztec uses, all of our cryptography, cryptographic protocols, they rely on very standard computational assumptions. They rely on cryptographic assumptions that are based around elliptic curves, which have been established for decades now, um, and so relatively conventional. So on that count, also, um, we have an extremely high degree of confidence that our protocol is secure. And if the underlying elliptic curve primitives turn out to not be secure, then then basically that has ramifications for, for things much wider than Aztec. Uh, the Ethereum protocol itself won't be secure in that um, setting. Absolutely. So from you as a, as a subject matter expert, when do you think quantum computers will break these uh, forms of cryptography? So, yes, quantum computers. I might be one of the most biased people um, to, to ask that question because obviously the consequences of quantum computing becoming practical are, are severe for us. We'd have to move to quantum secure proving systems. Um, they're slower, they're less efficient. We ideally not want, don't want to do that. Generally, I think that we're, we are at least multiple decades away from quantum computers being practical. There's been a lot of uh, developments lately from uh, Google and similar companies about the concept of quantum supremacy, um, where a, a milestone has been achieved in quantum computing where um, quantum computers can perform a computation more efficiently than classical computers, which is a big deal. That computation, however, is the measurement of quantum mechanical noise. So I think it, it, it gives a false impression of how advanced quantum computing is. Generally, to do something like run Shaw's algorithm, which is the algorithm you, you need to run on a quantum computer to crack an elliptic curve, you need an extremely large number of kind of um, quantum bits in your, in your quantum computer. And the difficulty of keeping a quantum system stable increases exponentially with the number of bits. So like um, a 32 qubit system is not twice as difficult to achieve as a 16 bit qubit system. It's actually it's, it's like 2 to the 16 times harder to achieve. And so given the number of qubits required to run Shor's algorithm and the current state of quantum computers, I mean, I'm very confident that we're going to have a, basically we're going to have a lot of warning, many mul multiple years of warning before quantum computers become practical enough to break elliptic curves. So I'll have plenty of time to migrate. And I don't see that happening for a very long time. Well, that's reassuring. <laughs> so before we wrap up, tell our listeners where they can find more uh, information about Aztec Protocol, perhaps even uh, you know, integrate Aztec within their Ethereum apps or dApps. Yeah, thanks. So the uh, best place to find information on us uh, is aztecprotocol.com. From there, you can uh, get straight into uh, digging through our, our docs, integrate the SDK. It's a pretty quick and simple process. We've made it uh, really fast because we uh, wanted to encourage uh, integrations at hackathons. So we want people to be able to, to adopt privacy super fast without it getting in, in the way of what they're doing at hackathons. And we've got some nice interactive docs there as well. Uh, we've got a new research page, uh, which shows you all of the mathematical research uh, that we've been involved in or produced as a, as a company and some uh, explainers as well. So if you're a kind of... Uh, uh, amateur mathematician and you want to find out a little bit more about zero knowledge tech hopefully those explainers will will help you understand get a bit of intuition for what's going on uh, without having to kind of sift through these uh, 20 30 40 50 page uh, research papers and uh, also uh, join our our telegram uh, we've got a telegram channel uh, aztec protocol uh, and also uh, a twitter which is where we send out most of our uh, major uh, news releases etc uh, and that's probably the best way to to uh, contact us and uh, yeah, please feel free to reach out. Hello at AzdecProtocol.com is a good place to get in touch with us to, to get help with integrating the SDK or anything else you want to know. Great. 
Tom, Zach, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.